morning we're going to take a look at the next uh, couple of elements in this man of one. We could have probably, you know, almost mixed these up in any different sort of way, but it, it's not really which ones we look at in what order, just that getting the complete picture. And we want to remind you that this is a vision of the saints, a word painting that illustrates to us the whole doctrine of God manifestation. And it requires action of us. So if we want to be part of this man of one that is revealed to Daniel and revealed in the book of Revelation, then we have to develop these characteristics now. We have to be making ourselves part of it and becoming one of the achad, one of the one. So we'd like to consider then, uh, this morning in our session, to begin with, this idea of being clothed with linen garments. And we think of it, the idea of being clothed in linen, the word there in the idea of strongs really is clothed. It is the word labash, which means to put on clothes, but to be fully clothed. Being clothed is a sign of rank, status, or character. So this feature is really a comment on our spiritual state. And we're going to examine that in the next few moments. So this is the idea then. But it's also that he is clothed with linen. And the linen is the idea, it's the Strong's number 906, and it's the word for the linen ephod. So it's not just linen, white cloth, but specifically it is the linen ephod. And when we look at that, immediately our minds probably go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 18, because there we have, of course, Samuel ministering before Yahweh, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Because the linen ephod was the garment of the priests or the Levites. And so when we think about this, we want to just jump back into Exodus and just take a, a little look at what is described for us in this. So Exodus chapter 28, we have there the description of what this linen ephod was all about. So Exodus 28 and verse 42. We read there, "...there shall make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even to the thighs shall they reach." So here's the idea of the linen, and its role was to cover the nakedness. And we read about it again in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 32. "...the priest whom, whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement." and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. So when we're talking about white linen, its role is to cover nakedness, but is described as holy garments. So this isn't just clothing, but it's holy garments. And the word, of course, holy is that word kodesh, which has the idea of being separate or being set apart, being sanctified. So when we look at the man of one, he's identifiable as being part of the priesthood because he's wearing linen garments. And of course, that makes perfect sense because we're told, well, first of all, in Exodus, that we're to be a kingdom of priests. And that comes up again when Peter brings it up, that we're to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the goal. And so when we look at this man of one, he is depicted that way. And you can tell him that he is a priest by his garments. In fact, this is what we find throughout the scriptures. If you come to uh, 1 Samuel 22, verse 18, it's the story of Doeg, uh, the Edomite, and David. We read there in verse 18, the king said to Doeg, so this is Saul, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and fell upon the priests. Well, how does he know they're priests? Well, he slew that day four score and five persons that did wear the linen ephod. So you could tell a priest because they wore the holy garments. They wore the linen ephod. And it comes up in 1st of Chronicles 15, verse 27, with David, right? David is going to lead the procession of the ark going into Jerusalem. So what does he do? Well, he dresses himself up. He is clothed with a robe of fine linen and all the Levites that bear the ark and the singers and Kenaniah, the master of song with the sinners. David also had upon him an ephod of linen. 
So this is the idea, is that David identifies himself with the priesthood by wearing the linen ephod. So when we look at this man of one, he's a priest. He's a king priest. He's part of that Melchizedekian priesthood, and he's identified with the priesthood. And it's interesting when we look at the, the symbolic visions. We talked about Ezekiel's vision the other day. And during that vision, Ezekiel is brought, and he's right into Jerusalem, right into the temple. He's next to the, to the laver. And he sees six men come from the way of the higher gate, which lies towards the north. They all have a slaughter weapon in their hands. But with them, there is one man among them who wears the linen ephod. And he's got the writer's inkhorn. And he, of course, is the scribe. So the scribe, who was a Levite, also is depicted as wearing the linen ephod. And what they come for is the judgment of the house of Yahweh, the judgment of the house of Israel, the judgment of Jerusalem. And that scribe has to go through the city and make a mark on every forehead of those who sigh and cry for the abominations. They are sealed of God in their forehead. And the one who does the sealing is the one wearing the linen ephod. And that's, of course, what the Lord Jesus Christ does with every single one of us. He seals his Father's name in our foreheads. It's interesting, too, if you're, if you're in Daniel still, just go over to Daniel chapter 12. So Daniel chapter 10 is where we have this linen ephod. But chapter 12, this same character appears again. And uh, it comes up in Daniel chapter 12 and at verse uh, 6. Then said... Or sorry, and one said to the man clothed in linen, well, who's this man? It's the one that was by the waters of the river, the river Hiddekel, the river of the Tigris. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and so he goes on. But again, it identifies us with the priesthood. And it identifies us with this man of one. So Daniel's able to recognize him later on. It's the guy wearing the linen ephod. So he can see who he is. So let's join our cruise then back in the Mediterranean. And let's come to the book of Revelation. Here is John on the Isle of Patmos. And he sees something similar. So John is there. He's in the garments of spirit, as it puts it there. Um, and it says there, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So here we have one who is clothed with, or down to the foot. So it's not just, you know, this is not a, a mini skirt sort of ephod. It's not just coming to sort of just above the knees or something like that. This is right down to the foot. All of his nakedness is covered. And he's identified there as one like the Son of Man. And of course, like is a simile. You know, we learn that in school, similes use like or as. So it's a picture. This isn't the Son of Man exclusively. It's one like the Son of Man, which of course is the multitudinous Christ, because we shall be like him. And that's the picture that's given to us here. So how is he depicted? He's wearing this garment down to the foot. So it's interesting that there is, of course, a deeper meaning in this. These are symbols, similes. What does it mean to be clothed in white? Well, of course, there's one sense is that it's the garments of spirit. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul tells us in verse 1, We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, be, uh, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So this is the idea of being clothed upon with the garments of spirit clothed upon with immortality. A change of nature. That's what we are looking for. But brothers and sisters, again, it's a call to action. If we want to be changed in nature, then we have to now put on garments of holiness. They have to be made white in the blood of the Lamb. It can't be something that, you know, we get to the kingdom and, and a little bit of, you know, hope and trust and pixie dust or whatever is sprinkled on you and, and all of a sudden you're all changed and you become a new person. It doesn't work that way. We have to be changed now. We have to go through that process.
Well, come back to Daniel chapter 7, because in Daniel chapter 7, we are introduced to a picture there, and there's two characters in Daniel chapter 7. One of them is like the Son of Man, but there's also this other character who sits upon the throne. And, of course, this is the Ancient of Days. It comes in in verse 9. He says there, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. So the Ancient of Days is wearing a garment that is white as snow. And the hairs of his head were pure like wool. Well, we're going to see that. It's the same characteristic as the man of one in the book of Revelation. It's a lamb-like quality. The throne was like a fiery flame, and he has wheels which are burning like a flame. So it connects to the cherubim. Here's the wheels of the cherubim. And a fiery stream issues and, and comes forth. From before him, thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment set and the books were opened. So that's the picture that we have in Daniel of this Ancient of Days. Now, when you look at that Ancient of Days, you say, well, who is this? And some people say, well, this is God. Well, it's actually not God. Because you've got to stop and just think about, what are we told in here? Well, he doesn't sit upon his throne until the other thrones are cast down. God is on his throne in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne as I have overcome and am sat down with my father in his throne. So the Lord is already sitting upon his throne, that is the father, Yahweh, in the heavens. And Christ says, I am going to sit on my throne. I'm going to invite you to come sit with me. Matthew chapter 19 tells us, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, right, you who have, who have uh, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits upon the throne of his glory, you also will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So the Lord takes his throne, he's on the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool, and then he takes his throne. Well, the Ancient of Days doesn't sit down until the other thrones are cast down. So that tells us this isn't God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes that's tough to swallow, but just think about it. What's his title? Ancient of days. God is uncreate. This one is ancient of days. Not only that, but he's surrounded by ten thousands of thousands. These are the saints. At no point in time are we off to heaven to join our Father there. We know that. This is about the kingdom of God being established on the earth. Not only that, but we have the cherubic vision, the wheels and the burning of the fire. And the fact that his hair is like wool is a lamb-like quality, which we'll look at in a future class. But anyway, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is depicted as being in a garment as white as snow. So when we look at this idea then of the linen garments, we have to sort of you know, go to the obvious um, and that is Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7, where we're told what white linen means. We're told there, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So when we see white linen, it is righteousness of the saints. And this picture is not just unique to the book of Revelation. It comes up in the 132nd Psalm. We read in verse 8, Arise, O Yahweh, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. Well, the priests are clothed with a linen ephod, a white garment, which is, of course, a garment of righteousness. And we read in Job chapter 29 and verse 14, I put on righteousness, it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. So this is the picture that we have. The white linen is the righteousness of the saints. And of course we know, if just come to Romans chapter 4, this isn't something that, you know, we, we work at, brothers and sisters, but we don't earn it. Remember it says there that his wife has made herself ready. So there's action required. We have to be involved in this process. But at the same time it says it was 
granted to her. It's something that's gifted to her to wear this, this garment. And the reason, of course, is Romans chapter 4, verse 20, it's picking up on Abraham, who staggered not at the promise God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God of being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. Therefore, it's imputed to him for righteousness, and it's not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. It's faith counted for righteousness. And so this is what these garments are all about. It's about righteousness, but it's the righteousness of imputed faith. It's not self-righteousness. It's the righteousness of imputed faith. So it's also, though, something that's involved, because it's involved with faith, it's involved in this idea of watching. There is action that is seriously required of us. It's not just sort of a, you know, you show up, you're issued a garment, and off you go. This is something that we've been working at during our lives. We've been engaging in this process. We've been participating in it. And so we have in Revelation 16, verse 15, we're told, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. So the idea of being clothed in a white garment is immediately tied with the idea of watching. So those two things go together. Watching, lest, and keeping our garments, lest we walk naked and our shame is revealed. So nakedness has to do with not watching. And that, of course, comes to us from Young's literal translation, Proverbs 19, <coughs> 29, verse 18, uh, without a vision, the people is made naked. Uh, the AV has perished. But that's the idea. Without a vision, we're made naked. And so the Lord requires of us to engage ourselves in this action. It's not sort of just a, a passive thing. There are no armchair warriors in the truth. There's just no such thing. You know, there's, you cannot be an armchair warrior. You have to get off the couch and engage in spiritual warfare. And so we read there in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And we'll come back to that one later on. But the point here is it's action related to watching and faith which is imputed to us for righteousness. It also has to do, brothers and sisters, with a change of nature. A change, as we read about what uh, Paul had to say, of being clothed upon. Come back to Zechariah chapter 3. Because in Zechariah chapter 3, this is illustrated for us in the person of Joshua. Joshua the high priest, right? And it's there for us in verse 3 of Zechariah 3. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Well, that's all of us, brothers and sisters. Our nature is filthy. Standing before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood by, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said unto him, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, I will clothe thee in a change of raiment. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. So here you have a priestly garment and a crown. This is the king priest. This is the Melchizedek priesthood. And the angel of Yahweh stood by. And the angel of Yahweh protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts. And here's the qualifier. If thou wilt walk in my ways... And if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk amongst these that stand by. The ones that stand by are the angels. And so, brothers and sisters, it's a qualified entrance into the kingdom. It's not once saved, always saved. It's a participatory entrance sacrifice. That's what the atonement's about, is our participating in it. And we'll look at that later on when we look at the Lamb. We don't believe in substitution. We don't believe that Jesus did this for our sins and he took the bullet for us and that's it and we're saved and we can do anything. It's not the way it is. He asks us to join him. And this is what he says. He qualifies it. 
if you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then. It's an if-then statement. It's a very logical statement. I will give you, um, then you will judge my courts, and or my house, and, and keep my courts, and I will give you places to walk amongst these that stand by. So that's the picture that we're given. And brothers and sisters, this is the picture of the new man. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, we looked at this. Behold, the manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And he says, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Well, that's picked up by the Lord in Revelation 3 and verse 4. He says, you have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk worthy, or she walk with me in white, for they are worthy. But notice that, they will walk with me in white, because that is the priestly garment of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Joshua who had his nature changed. And we are invited to walk with him in white. Why? Because they're worthy. They have not defiled their garments. And that's what we've got to adopt, brothers and sisters. It's a difficult age in which we live. Jude tells us we are to hate the spotting of the garments by the flesh. We are not, brothers and sisters, to countenance sin. We're not to just kind of cover stuff up. What we have to do is cleanse it. And you can only cleanse it by the washing of the water of the word. And so we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at this, and I just want to kind of reiterate it. We are earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So we have to be found in this state. We have to be manifesting the Father now in our walk and in what we do. And then our, immor or our mortality will be swallowed up in life. And this, of course, is the picture of the bride of Christ. I, uh, Psalm 45, verse 13, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought to the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. And this is the picture we looked at in Revelation. His wife has made herself ready, and it's granted to her that she should be clothed in this imputed righteousness of the saints. So just to summarize, then, brothers and sisters, as we consider this, the man of one is clothed in linen garments. It's a picture of the multitudinous Christ, as we've been looking at. The elements described are representatives of characteristics that we have to adopt. Being clothed with a white garment indicates that they are fully clothed in righteousness. And that's what our lives have to be now. Having a watching mind, being alert, being shepherds, being watchmen to the house of God having faith imputed to them for righteousness because they believe what God has said and they are cleansed. And of course, we're going to look at that one a little bit more later on, but their nature eventually will be changed come the kingdom time. We want to consider now this idea of the fine gold of Euphaz. We read that in Daniel chapter 10, if you just want to turn back there again so we, we kind of find our place, it's only two verses, but... Daniel chapter 10, the detail that's packed into here is just amazing, really. But he says, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, a certain man, clothed in linen that we've looked at, but his loins are girded with fine gold of Euphaz. And so when we look at that, we say, well, what does this mean? Well, the loins, of course, is obviously uh, the loins or the hips, the waist area. Um, and it's girded, which means to bind on a belt or a girdle. And it is with fine gold, which is the word kethem, which means pure gold. So it's not just any old gold. This is fine gold, and it's gold of euphaz. And so what is euphaz? Well, euphaz is a corruption of the word ophir. You've heard of the gold of ophir? Well, this is what it is. So the idea, the word literally means reduced to ashes, which is the idea of a furnace or burning. And it's the smelting process of purifying gold. It's not just gold that's raw, dug out of the ground, but it's gone through this refining process. And Euphaz, of course, was a descendant of the sons of Shem. It's given to us in uh, 1 Chronicles 1, verse 17, the sons of Shem, and he lists them all off. And of Joktan, there is Sheba and Ophir, 
And Ophir, we're told in Genesis 10, verse 30, is um, their dwelling was from Misha till they goest to Sephar, a mount on the east. And it's believed to be um, on the, the uh, side of the Red Sea, as is indicated there. And of course, we get a little bit more detail. Uh, we know that it was down that neck of the woods because in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 3, David talks about having set his affection upon the house of his God and all the provisions he made, a thousand talents of gold from Ophir. That's what was used to overlay the walls of the house with all. So this is the most precious substance David could find that's going to be used for the adorning of the house of Yahweh. And of course, Jehoshaphat, uh, we read in 1 Kings 22, verse eight, er, 48, made ships of Tarshish to go uh, to Ophir for, for gold. Um, and he leaves from Ezion Geber, which of course is uh, a lap today. And um, there it is on the, the top of the Red Sea. So it's heading south, um, looking for this place of Ophir. So it's a very precious metal, not just any old gold, but this is the best, most refined gold that you could find. But again, this is a symbol. It's a simile. And we say, well, what exactly does this represent? And of course, when we look at the scriptures, Job chapter 28, verse 12, tells us that wisdom is equated with gold. Where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither can it be, shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, nor the fine gold and the jewels. It's the price of wisdom which is above rubies. Neither can it be valued with pure gold. So what he's telling us here is that godly wisdom is of greater value than even the most valuable gold that came from Ophir. And of course, the product of godly wisdom, we read in Romans 10, 17, is faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And it's a quality that without which we can't be part of the man of one. Because Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us without faith, it's impossible to please him. Because he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this is a vital, necessary ingredient in our discipleship, is that gold faith that comes from wisdom. But just take a look at a couple of other passages to help us really understand. Like, you know, it's again, it's not, faith is not pixie dust. You know, it's not just some warm, fuzzy feeling that, you know, the evangelicals will kind of paint that descends on you and you get this warm glow inside and you feel all good. It's a substantiated characteristic that has a source. And that source is the word of God. Without the word of God, you can't have faith. And that's why the whole picture that's given to us with the virgins and the, the five wise and the five foolish is that they have taken the time to get oil in their vessels, which is, of course, how we get faith. So we read in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is, right, is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous together, altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. And so the psalmist goes on to say, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, than fine gold. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate Every false way, Proverbs, or Psalm 119, verse 127, 128. That last part's the hard part, though, isn't it? Hating every false way. It's hard for us to do that. It's hard for us to hate evil because it's pleasing to our natures. It's not called the pleasure of sin for a season for nothing. It appeals to us. And the Lord Jesus Christ, we read in Isaiah, 
It says that butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know how to choose the good and to refuse the evil. So he made the choice of good over evil based on his consumption of butter and honey. I also think that's the weirdest sort of, like, what does that all mean? Well, you can stop and think, honey is not that difficult. I mean, you know, it's, it's the word of God is to be desired more than, than much honey. And the milk of the word is butter as well. But don't forget, it's also a land flowing with milk and honey. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked past the present to the future, to the glory of the kingdom age, and he valued that more so that when it came time to make a choice, he put those two things up there, and he valued the kingdom of God and his word more than he valued the pleasure of sin for a season. And so he made those right choices every single time. And we need to model ourselves after him. And so we're told to receive wisdom and instruction, not silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that thou desirest are, are not to be compared of it. And so, brothers and sisters, this has to be the pursuit of our lives. If we want to be part of this man of one, and it's a simple concept, but it's one that requires immense effort and energy on our behalf. Proverbs 16, verse 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than uh, to be chosen than silver? Really? What do we think about that when we go back to work? It's all about getting gold and silver and cattle and goods and a great spoil. I mean, really, I mean, that's what the whole world is designed to do. But we have to get it into our heads, brothers and sisters, and that's not what we're here for. That's not what we're to be about. We can't get consumed with these things. The earring of gold and the ornament of fine gold, so is the wise reprover upon an obedient ear. It's a comparison. The word of God is like gold on our ears. It adorns us. But only, brothers and sisters, if we're obedient to its reproofs. If we spurn its reproofs, if we try to minimize its effect, if we try not to listen to those words, then it's not going to help us. It's amazing, you see, brothers and sisters, that the sons of Zion are described this way. It's in Lamentations, and it's in a negative context, but it gives you... The fact that this is the way God looks at us. How is thy gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. How are they esteemed as an earthen pitcher? And the work of the hands of the potter. <coughs> That's the way it was in the time of, of course, Jeremiah, when Israel was invaded by the Babylonians. But the point is this. The sons of Zion are supposed to be esteemed compared to fine gold. But he says, they're just treated like a potter's vessel. We are surrounded, brothers and sisters, by sons of Zion. What is our attitude to those sons of Zion around us? Do we esteem our brother better than choice gold? Or do we look at them as just simply earthen vessels? broken, toss them away. Is that how they, they are to us? I think of the words of, of Philippians, chapter 2. I mean, it's right there for us. To esteem our brother better than ourselves. That's the idea here. But that's not the way it was at this time. But that's the way God looks at it. The sons of Zion are like precious vessels of gold. But it's not just gold, is it, brothers and sisters? It's tried gold. Come to 1 Peter chapter 7, or chapter 1, sorry, in verse 7, because here we have that passage that, that we're familiar with, but just to drive this point home, it's not just gold. It's gold that has been refined. It's gold of Ophir that's come from the burning furnace, right? The trial of our faith, we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tried with the fire. It might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So this is the picture that we're going through. It's the trial of our faith now. All the troubles that we're going through, brothers and sisters, we shouldn't just spurn them and think, oh, you know, enough of this. We've got to engage in them. 
we have to embrace them and say, what is it that God is trying to teach me? When I'm in adversity, what am I supposed to learn out of this? We've been talking about this with young people, with Ruth and Naomi. Naomi is in Moab. She loses her husband. Hello. At that point, should you not question, what am I doing here? Then she loses Malon. Hello. Do we not hear the voice of the angel yet? Then she loses Chilion, and finally she arises and goes back to Jerusalem. When we're in adversity, brothers and sisters, we have to listen for the voice of God, the voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, and embrace the process, because it's a process that's necessary to be part of this man of one. Think of Proverbs 17, verse 3. The fining pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but Yahweh trieth the hearts. It's the refined gold. It comes through the furnace. He says in Job 23, verse 10, He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And brothers and sisters, we have to embrace the chastening hand of our God. And that could be individually, it could be as a family, it might be as a community or an ecclesia, and it might be as the ecclesial community. We've got to look at if things are not going right, why? What is God trying to teach us through this? What is it we've got to change in our individual lives? If our family is experiencing difficulty, why is that? What is it that's being purged out of this whole thing? And instead of kicking against it, embrace it. And try and work with God. It says in Psalm 139, it's, I call it the prayer of the brave. You know, where, where the psalmist says, search me now herewith. Prove me if there's any evil way in me. Lead me to the path of righteousness. And that's what we've got to do. Is ask God to cleanse, purify, and work with us so that we can be part of this man of one. Isaiah 48 verse 10. This is what God does with all his sons. Uh, sorry, this is Zechariah 13, verse 9. This is Israel, right? First of all, future age. It's the same God in the past as it's going to be in the future. He says, I'm going to bring a third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and try them as gold is tried. They will call upon my name and I will hear them and say it's my people and they will say Yahweh is my God. And so, brothers and sisters, this is what God does to Israel, will do in the future. But it's what he's doing to us now, what he did to Israel in the past. Isaiah 48 verse 10 tells us, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. So, cheer up, saints. It's going to get worse. You know, God is going to turn the heat up. And he's going to keep on boiling away our infirmities. And the sooner that we engage with him in this process instead of kicking against the pricks as Saul did for so long, the easier it's going to be. Because we will be refined. Not that it's going to be an easy process, but it's going to have the, the, the fruit of righteousness developed out of this. I mean, brothers and sisters, it's the only way into the kingdom of God. It's the only way Israel is getting into the kingdom. <clears throat> Zechariah tells us, I'm going to refine them. A third of them are only well, the ones who are going to survive it, but I'm going to refine them. It's no different for us. Acts 14, verse 22, Paul exhorts them to continue in the faith. And that's something we've got to remember. Never mind going away. We've got to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, we're going through tribulation. But this is the doorway to the kingdom. Be exercised by it personally in your own life. What stands between me and the kingdom of God? What are those impurities that only I know about? Purge them out. Work with him. Do what he says. Listen to his voice. Wash you, make you clean. It's through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. So we have to join tribulation. I mean, we say that's so kind of a cliche almost after a while, but really this is what it means. It means engage in it. It means to, to grab a hold of it with two hands. So that we basically can be part of this process. So we have the Son of Man who is girt about the paps with a golden girdle. 
Right, just to go through the meanings of the word here, the idea of girt, this is in the, the uh, section in John's um, vision, it literally means to fasten uh, garments with a girdle or a belt, to gird oneself. So how our garments of righteousness are fastened is with faith. That's how they're held up. Well, he's girt about the paps. The Greek word is mastos, which is the idea of the breast. It's where we get the word mastectomy from, right? So that's what it is, the chest, right? So it's around the chest that we are to be girt. So it's not just the idea of a belt. The picture's probably fairly accurate. It's kind of from the paps right the way down to the waist. It was a, a, a waistband. I mean, we have these silly little things called cummerbunds or whatever they are. You make you wear at a wedding when you look like a penguin. That's kind of like sort of a similar idea, but maybe a bit bigger, right? So that's, that's the idea here. And it's with a golden girdle. It's, uh, the word there is the idea of being made of gold, overlaid with gold. It's precious things, um, ornaments of gold. And it's a girdle, which is the Greek word zone. And that's why Brother Thomas calls it the golden zone, right? Uh, sometimes you read what he's, where does he get that from, the golden zone? But it's literally the Greek word means zone. So this is the idea. This is the zone that is going to be covered in gold, right? The girdle, the belt, um, not just for a flowing girdle, but also it was used to carry the money in. That's interesting. Where you put your valuables is in your girdle, close to your heart. But that's where it goes, right? And so we have there then this, this picture, and it's the seven angels who come out of the temple having the seven vials. What are they doing? Well, they're clothed in pure and, and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. So these other characters in the book of Revelation, they're all related to this. They're all part of the same vision, and this is what we have to be. So, brothers and sisters, this is the idea, the loins being girded. Well, what about the loins, just for a minute? Well, the loins, of course, are a symbol of strength. Um, Job tells us, chapter 40, verse 16, Lo, his strength is in his loins, and his force in the navel of his belly. So it's the muscles of the stomach. This is the idea. This is where strength is tied in. And when Cyrus is brought against um, the kings of Babylon, in Isaiah 45, verse 1, Yahweh said to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of kings. So they're going to lose their strength. I'm going to open the gates. I always love this passage. You know, I mean, this is God talking about how he works with a king. And it's like the picture of a little two-year-old. He takes his hand and he walks him along. You know, I have holden your right hand. I've, I've taken you along to do my will. And that's what he will do with us, brothers and sisters to work his will in our lives. It's also a symbol, though, of, of power in a different sense. You have Elijah the Tishbite in 2 Kings 1, verse 18, or verse 8, sorry. He was girt with a, with a leather girdle about his loins. That's how they identified him. It was a, a symbol of identification for Elijah the Tishbite. That's how they knew who he was. It was a prophet's garment, having a girdle around the waist. Jeremiah tells us that Israel to God is a girdle. As the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so I have caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the house of Judah, saith Yahweh, that they might be unto me for a people, for a name, for a praise, and for a glory. But unfortunately, they wouldn't have it. Well, brothers and sisters, we too are invited to be part of the girdle, just like Israel was. To be to him... A people, a name, a praise, and a glory. So the question is, will we have it? Will we be part of this man of one? Do we want to be part of this girdle? It's also, of course, the loins that we read of in Genesis chapter 35, verse 11. God says to Abraham, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful, multiply. Nations and a company of nations shall be of thee. Kings shall come out of thy loins. So it's tied to the kingly seed that we've been called to be, kings and priests. And so it was to be, in 2 Chronicles 6, verse 9, that he's told, David this is, later on, uh, thy son which shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build a house for my name. So that's another element to it. It's tied with the promised seed. This was the strength of the future generations. And so, brothers and sisters, what do we do with the strength of God's future generations amongst us? This is what we've got to be about. 
It's also a symbol, of course, of godliness, but a preparation in action. We think of the words of Exodus 12, verse 11. Thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You're going to eat it in haste. It's Yahweh's Passover ready for deliverance out of the land. So the idea of having your loins girded is also the idea of being ready for action. And of course, this was, it's a very fitting slide, this next one, because I kind of feel like this coming between classes. You know, here we have the hand of Yahweh upon Elijah. He gird up his loins and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So that's the prophets. They girded up their loins and they ran. Think of the words of Jeremiah. I mean, brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be girded with a golden girdle. This is what it means to be part of the man of one. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. Having our loins girded means to speak the truth. Speaking the truth in love, albeit, but speaking the truth. We do not do each other any favors, brothers and sisters, if we don't speak the truth. Just think of, I remember Uncle Frank years ago telling the story of the, the old man sitting on his, on his deck. You know, he's got a, a wooden house and the thing's going up in flames and he's deaf as a post. You know, he can't hear anything and he's snoozing away on his rocker, rocking on the porch. And you're yelling and screaming at him and he ain't moving because he can't hear you. He can't hear the fire roaring behind him. In fact, it's nice and warm. It's a bit of a cool day, you know. And he's asleep. And the only way to save his life is to go up there and slap him across the face. You know, sometimes agape love requires of us that we act and we speak the truth in love to save our brethren. And some people might argue, well, you know, that's not very loving. But well, what, you're going to let him burn on the porch? But that's the point, brothers and sisters. Being a prophet like this was to speak the truth in love, to actually say what God wants us to say. That's true agape love, to tell our brother and our sister that, you know, this is God's way walking in it. This is the way of death. And it's difficult, brothers and sisters. It's not easy to do, but that's true love when we see somebody that is falling astray. It's also interesting because it was on the loins where was girded the weapons. Second Samuel 20, verse 18, we read of uh, Joab's army, um, or his garment that he had on, that was girded to him. Upon it was girded the sword fastened upon the loins to, in the sheath thereof. So it's the symbol of preparation for action, for war. Remember we talked about the, the man with the, the inkhorn. The inkhorn was girded also on his side. So it's the scribe's inkhorn girded on the side. So both of those things represent action. We have to be ready to act in the truth. There are no armchair warriors in the truth. But it's also a symbol, brothers and sisters, if you come to John chapter 13, and this is perhaps one that we, we need to think about. John chapter 13, it is a symbol of service. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, when he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and he <coughs> girded himself. This is verses 4 and 5. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. It's a symbol of service in the truth. And he goes on to say, verse 15, I have given you an example. Well, that's what the man of one's all about. It's a picture, a word picture, an example for us to follow, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than him that sent him. So it's about being in the Lord's service. And of course, this whole idea of being ready for action, ready for service, ready to speak the word of God when we're called upon, is the idea in 1 Peter. Just come over to 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is, of course, where it really rings true for us, comes right home to us. This is directed not against Israel, or not to Israel, not the disciples. I mean, we can sort of argue, well, that was them, you know, whatever we want to say. But this is literally right to us. We take the lesson, we are not accepted. First of Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we're told, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, 
be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remove all the clutter, brothers and sisters, all the things that get in the way of our thinking. Get them out of the way. Get ourselves ready to run. Prepare ourselves to be part of the man of one. Whatever it is that is rattling around in our heads, that's taking our focus off the truth, that's taking our minds and our hearts and it's absorbing all of our time, get it out of the way. Because this is what we're called to do. Gird up the loins of our minds and be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is almost here. And of course, that is the words of Hebrews. Turn this one up as well. Hebrews chapter 12, because this is really, when you look at this idea of girding, and really, what does it mean to us? We've looked at all these facets. He says in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin that doth so easily beset us, and run with patience the race that's set before us. You can't run if your loins are not girded. And that's what we've got to do, brothers and sisters. Lay aside all the clutter and all the things that get in our way and run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, there's one other facet to this. Come over to Ephesians chapter 6. We talked about it just briefly with Joab. But, of course, it is what gets put on the thigh, what is girded to the soldier. It's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. We read, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And that's the whole point. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, having that shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we'll look at that later on. But that's the point, brothers and sisters, is that we have to have ourselves fully girded, ready to go, the sword of the Spirit, girding our loins with truth, ready to be about uh, our Lord's business. This is what he calls us to do. This is his direct exhortation to us, to be alert, girding our loins, watching, Come to uh, Luke chapter 12, because Luke chapter 12 paints this picture. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking directly to us once again. He says to us in verse 35, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding. The day cometh, and he knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, will find doing. For I say unto you, he will gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Like to me, that is just, I, I can't even fathom that. That the Lord would gird himself and come forth and serve his saints. But the point is, brothers and sisters, that's what we have to be doing now. If we want to be part of that man of one, we have to be following him. We have to be doing that amongst ourselves right now, having our loins girded about and our lights brightly burning. And one last thing. It's girded around the heart, right? I mean, this is the zone. From the, from the paps down to the waist. This is the innards, right? This is where the kidney and the liver and the heart, all those vital organs are. This is the area that is to be girded up. Turn over, brothers and sisters, to um, Matthew chapter 6. Because Matthew chapter 6, he tells us about this idea of our hearts. And the idea of girding our hearts and girding about this area with this golden girdle is kind of juxtaposed. Matthew chapter 6, it's around the heart and the vital organs, right, that this whole thing is going to be around, girt about the packs. So what does that mean to us? Matthew 6, verse 19, we're told, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now the word for treasure, we're familiar with it. 
It's the Greek word thesaurus, and it means a vault. That's the whole idea. A storehouse, a vault, a strong room, a magazine, the place where we put our valuables. Well, brothers and sisters, what is it that we lock away in our hearts? What is it that we are treasuring in our hearts? What do we pile up in our vaults? What is it that's there inside of every single one of us? That's the thing that we've got to really think about. Psalm 119 tells us what it should be. He says there, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. That's what's got to be in our vault. That's what's got to be the most precious thing in our vaults, is the word of God. Proverbs 2, verse 1, My son, if you will receive my words, hide thy commandments, my commandments with thee. So shalt thou incline thine ear to wisdom, apply thy heart to knowledge, cry after knowledge, lift up thy voice for understanding, seek her as silver, and search for her as for hid treasure. This has to be, brothers and sisters, what is at the core of who we are. And the Lord says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. The purse is the girdle. Don't fill our purses and our hearts with the treasures of this world. Fill it with the word of God. That is worth more than anything that we can possibly think about in this world. But at the same time, we do have to be reminded that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are imperfect right now, brothers and sisters, every single one of us. But we've got to fill those vessels with gold. And this is the exhortation we looked at with the raiment. It's the same thing with the gold. In Revelation chapter 3, in verse 18, we're counseled to buy gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. And that's what we've got to do. Be clothed, to see, to have that vision, be rich. This is what we've got to put all our effort and expense into is pursuing this goal. You see, it's something you don't buy with money. It's bought with effort. And so we read in Isaiah 55 and verse 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which doesn't satisfy. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So just summarizing, brothers and sisters, what have we learned in this session? Well, the golden zone, as it's called by Brother Thomas, is... The idea of having made the investment to search out the wisdom of God. This is true riches, which is, of course, likened to faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God and is refined through tribulation. And we have to enjoin ourselves into that tribulation and learn from it. Treasure the truth in our hearts. This has got to be what fills our vaults, our thesaurus. This is what's got to be the most close to us. And have our loins gird, be ready with the thinking of God, true strength, brothers and sisters, to serve our God like the prophets of old. And if we do this, brothers and sisters, we have a hymn that says, We shall be like him, which of course is taken from that first epistle of John. Well, what is the Lord Jesus Christ described as? Isaiah 11, verse 5. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. That is the man of one. And that's the one, brothers and sisters, who we have to model ourselves after.